God's Word together, Luke chapter 23, and uh, we'll pick up there. Now let's get these batteries here in this thing real quick. Thank you. All right. One, two, there we go. All right. Can everybody hear me? All right. There we go. Luke chapter 23 this morning. And uh, I'll tell you what verse here. Let me look at my notes here. All right, Luke chapter 23. Look there at verse 32. Luke chapter 23 and verse 32. Now we're going through on Sunday mornings the seven sayings of the cross. This is our second second Sunday doing that. And we're going to study the second statement uh, made by Jesus while he's hanging on the cross. As we told last week... um, Saying something on the cross was a difficult thing. The labor and all that that it took to to say something, to be able to speak, pushing up on the nails and pulling up to try to fix, you know, or try to get enough breath. You often die by asphyxiation on the cross and all that kind of stuff. Uh, saying words was no easy task. So if Jesus is speaking while on the cross... Uh, All of God's words are important, but these might have some extra meaning, right? So look there at Luke chapter 23, and we'll pick up there in verse 32. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We already talked about that, right? And they parted his garment, uh, excuse me, parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters, uh, over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou enterest, or excuse me, when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me. In paradise. So we're going to study that saying of Jesus on the cross. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church this morning. God, I pray that you help me as I try to preach this message, Lord, that you would help my voice a little bit scratchy this morning, a little bit strained for whatever reason. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help me as I try to convey these truths, give me strength, and I pray that they would sink down into the hearts of the people, anoint their ears, and Lord, I pray that you'd work in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Daddy, turn me up just a little bit on that lapel mic. My voice is just a little bit strained this morning. I want to give it a little bit of extra help. All right, notice now in Luke chapter 23, you of course know this story. Um, One of the most famous sayings out of the seven is when uh, Jesus makes the statement, today thou shalt be, well, that's a little much, that's a little too much there. Turn that down to just a a little too hot, too cold, but that, get it just right. A little little less, a little bit less there. That's probably good, that's probably perfect right there. Perfect, all right. Uh, But when Jesus looks over at this thief and makes the declaration, today shalt thou be with me, In paradise. I want you to notice a few things, though, about this statement. I want you to notice about this dying thief. Of course, a lot of preaching's been done about the dying thief. In fact, there's been a few songs written about the dying thief. 
But about this statement that Jesus makes, I want you to notice some of the things that are leading up to this statement. I want you to notice, first of all, uh, we see in John chapter number 19, it's not mentioned here in Luke's gospel, but when they hang Jesus on the cross, they hang him up between the two malefactors mentioned here, but John's gospel makes an interesting statement. It says that one of the thieves... uh, mocked Jesus and was taunting him, saying, Save us and save yourself if you be the Christ. And the Bible makes the interesting statement in John's Gospel. It says, And the other cast the same in his teeth. What you have to understand about this dying thief as he's hanging on the cross, he does not start out believing on Christ. It's not like he saw the trial and saw the mock jury and saw them crying crucified and he has this thing in his heart, man, I'm being crucified with this innocent man. No, no, no. The Bible says that when they first got on the cross, it wasn't just the thief on the left that was mocking Christ, but it was also the thief on the other side. It was the thief on the right-hand side that was also mocking. He cast the same in his teeth uh, as these soldiers, these or excuse me, these criminals, these hardened criminals are being marched up Calvary with Jesus Christ. They're mocking him. They're scorning him. They're joining right in the crowd. Uh, listen, can you imagine a dying man as such a hardened criminal, murderers, thieves, as they're being led away to be put to death, they're mocking Jesus. Can you imagine just how much of a hardened criminal you have to be to to be on your way to death's row, to be on your way to be crucified, and you're joining right in all all the crowd mocking Jesus Christ? Shame, man. And as they're being led up there, we see, number one, I want you to notice a few things. I want you to notice the criminals. This was a prophecy given in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 12 that Jesus Christ would be crucified with criminals. They treated him like a common criminal. They treated him like he was just a regular offender. They crucified him amongst common criminals. Notice that these were guilty men. These were men that were guilty of awful things. We don't know exactly what they were guilty of, but we do know that Barabbas was released that day, and Barabbas was a thief and a murderer. Notice these criminals are sitting there, and they're sitting in the jail cell, and no doubt they're going to be held in the same or close proximity of Barabbas and Jesus. And notice, it's the Passover. What was the custom of Pilate to do on the Passover? Release one of the prisoners. Every, you can read in John's Gospel, every Passover it was customary for Pilate to release one of the prisoners. I'll let you have one of your prisoners as a, as a token of goodwill and good faith here on the Passover. And so all these criminals are down there. Barabbas, the two that are crucified with Jesus, they're all sitting down there. And guess what they know what, to, what that day is. They say, hey, today there's a chance that any one of us are going to get a pardon from Pilate. These criminals are sitting there thinking, today could be the day that I'm released from this prison. Me and you could, might be able to escape death. We might be able to get away from the sentence that, that Pilate has put on us. Well, that was true, but they could have never imagined exactly how they were going to escape the sentence. Amen. They could go free, but they could have never imagined how they were going to be going free, Right? We understand later on in the story, one of them does get free. Now notice, we notice the criminals. Then we notice the comrade. This thief is hanging there on the cross and his comrade over here is mocking Jesus and he's casting the same in his teeth. But something happens. I don't know what, the Bible never says. But something happens to the thief on the right hand side. He sees something. I tell you what, I, the only thing that really transpires, unless there's something in the scriptures that we are not seeing or something that the scripture simply doesn't record, the only thing that happens between when they're first on the cross and the second statement that Jesus makes is as they're hanging there and as both of them are mocking Jesus and 
taunting Jesus and joining in with the crowd, all of a sudden Jesus cries out that first cry that we studied last week, and he says what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is everybody alive this morning? Can some of y'all act like you're not zombies? Get, get in bed on Saturday night or something, amen? Staying up all night. Now watch this, you ready? That thief's hanging there and he says, boy, I've heard a lot of people die. I've seen a lot of people die. I've heard for people begging for their lives. I've killed some guys that begged me not to kill them. I've got a family and I've got kids and don't kill me. I, I have done a lot of wicked things, but I have never heard a dying man hang on a cross and ask for, for the forgiveness of those around him. That's the only thing the scripture that we have to go off of that transpired between when that thief is taunting Jesus and when he finally wakes up. Notice not only do we see his comrade, but then we see the confession. Notice what this man says. Notice what this dying thief says in Luke's gospel, chapter 23, there in verse 40. He says, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? This thine thief is finally realizing, hey, I'm about to die. I'm about to face God. I'm about to meet my maker, as they say. I, 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 I'm realizing some things. Yeah, I know I, I was joining in with the mockery and the taunting, but I heard this man cry, Father, forgive thee. I he was crying out to his father, and I realized I have no heavenly father to cry out to. I've lived a terrible, awful, wicked life. And now, now he's got a little bit of fear of God. And it's amazing what a near-death experience will do for somebody. Amen. There's been a lot of people saved because they got real close to death. Hey, listen, I believe in deathbed confessions. I really do. I believe a man can get saved laying on his deathbed. I know some of these guys say, well, I don't believe in deathbed confessions. They live their whole life in rebellion against God, and then they want to cry out at the end of their life. Listen, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. I believe in deathbed confessions. Now watch this. One old writer said this. The Bible records one deathbed confession so that none may despair. There shouldn't be a, it, listen, nobody should ever be laying on their deathbed wondering if God's going to forgive them and receive them at the end of their life if they call out to him. He absolutely was. So the, that old writer said, there is one deathbed confession recorded so that none may despair, but only one so that none may presume. Do you get that? There's one deathbed confession recorded so that none may despair, but only one so that none may presume. The problem with deathbed confessions is you never know where your deathbed's going to be. The problem with deathbed confessions is you don't even know how your mental state's going to be. Uh, we buried both of my grandmothers the past uh, two months, and, uh, and they're, both of them were saved in heaven now, but their mental state at the end of their life, I mean, nobody could sit there and try to have a conversation with them. It was nearly impossible. They were responding in short little answers, if any response at all. Understand, there is no promise of tomorrow for anybody. Boast not thyself of the morrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. The Bible never says to wait on salvation for tomorrow. The New Testament makes the principle clear. Today is the day. Understand that this criminal's hanging there, this thief, this malefactor, he's hanging there, and 15, 20, 30 minutes ago, however long goes by, Jesus was on there for six hours. However long it was, uh, he was mocking and, and ridiculing, and then he hears, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And all of a sudden, he looks over, and that other guy's still mocking, but he says, Man, do you not fear God? Don't you know that we have done Everything that we've done, we deserve this, but this man has done nothing amiss. He says, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? You're sitting here mocking him, you're mocking Jesus, but you're dying the same death he's dying, and you have no fear of God. 
He says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And notice what he says. Uh, we see the grand confession. He looks over and he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy what? Kingdom. Now hold on a second. How in the world does this man know that Jesus Christ has a kingdom? Now maybe, maybe he heard about Jesus Beforehand, Jesus was a pretty popular character, right? The gospel says that his fame went abroad throughout all the country. Maybe he heard the 70 that went out two by two. You know, Jesus sent out 70 two by two preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Maybe he heard that. But I'm going to give you what, in my opinion, what I think happened. He's hanging there on the cross and he looks over at Jesus and guess what just so happens to be written over Jesus' head? This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And I guess that old boy thought, well, if he's a king, he's got to have a kingdom. Amen? And so you know, one, per, one preacher said that the thief got saved by reading the gospel tract that Pilate wrote and he hung on the top of the cross. Amen? And here's what's interesting. He wrote, this is the King of the Jews, but he writes it in Greek, he writes it in Latin, and he writes it in Hebrew. Now watch this. There's three groups of people. There's Hamites, Shemites, and Japhethites, right? right. Your Hamites are your blacks, your Africans, your Shemites are your Jews and Asians and Middle Easterners and all that. And your Japhethites are your Europeans and your, and your Westerners. Now watch this, you ready? Greek is a, a Japhethite language. Greek is an is a Anglo-Saxon language. It's European. Latin comes from where? Anybody know? Yeah. No, Latin comes from Africa. That's an African language. Latin, that's your Hamites. And then Hebrew is a Shemite language. It's for the Jews, right? So you have all three sons of Adam, the Greek, the Latin, and the Hebrew, all being written on this one sign because it's all for one. It, listen, that same message is for all the world, amen? The cross is for all people, red and yellow, black and white. They're precious in his sight. Now, here's another truth you get. Now, watch this. You ready? If you had a map of the world right here, you ready? You have what's called the Middle East. Why is it called the Middle East? Because it's in the middle, right? Now, watch this. The cross is right here in the middle. If you study this thing out, if you look on this side of the map and this side of the map, Everybody on this side of the map writes from left to right. When you write, you go like this. But everybody on this side of the map, all your Shemite languages, they write from right to left. That's why you pick up a Jewish Bible, you're probably picking it up backwards. If you ever see those Japanese comic books or whatever, you've got to read them backwards. See, because all things flow to the cross. Amen. And when Pilate writes that up there, and notice the Pharisees, now, boy, this is crazy. The Pharisees go and they say, no, no, Pilate, don't write, don't write, this is the king of the Jews. We want you to write, he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate makes that great declaration in John 19. He said, what I have written, I have written. See, Pilate wasn't interested in changing the words. And if Pilate had changed the words and said he said he was king of the Jews, uh, that man may have never gotten saved because they messed with what Pilate wrote. That's another message for another time. He said, what I have written, I have written. And he writes, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That thief hanging there to the right uh, looks up and he says, if he's a king, he's got to have a kingdom. And he says, Lord, Lord. Notice that word, Lord. He confesses who Jesus is, Lord. Isn't it interesting, though? All the modern translations leave out the word Lord in Matthew, or excuse me, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 42. All the modern translations leave out that word Lord. Why, in the, why on planet Earth would you want to leave out this man confessing Jesus is Lord? In fact, doesn't the Bible say, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus? Isn't that what it says? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. These modern translations slapping at the deity of Jesus, slapping at the confession of this thief. 
Now notice this. He says, Lord, remember me when thou enterest into thy kingdom. It's interesting. Jesus, or excuse me, the, the thief did not say, Lord, take me to the kingdom. He didn't say, Lord, make me a part of your kingdom. All he says, when you come into your kingdom, all I want you to do is just remember me. Just remember me. Now notice this. Jesus makes the statement in verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee. You know what that word verily means? That word verily means truthfully. Verily. That's where we get the word uh, verity. Can you verify that for me? The Greek, I think it's the Greek word veritas, truth. That's where we get that. Verify, the verity, the veracity. Well, can you, can you confirm the veracity of his statement? That means the truth of it. Can you confirm that it's true? Jesus makes a statement, Verily, truthfully, I say unto you, say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, I want you to notice this here. Jesus makes this statement. There's a few things about this statement that we need to look at. First of all, we see Jesus says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. See, what you've got to understand is that Jesus Christ didn't go to heaven when he died. His spirit went to heaven, but he himself, his body went in the ground, his spirit returned to God, because of the last statement, we'll state when we get there, he says, Father, into thy hands do I commend my spirit. But his soul, see, the three hours of darkness that Jesus is on the cross, Jesus' soul goes down to hell and suffers in hell the last three hours of darkness. His body's on the cross, but his soul's in hell. That's why the psalmist says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. So when Jesus dies, there are some people that teach that Jesus Christ goes to hell for the three days and three nights that he's dead. But that can't be true because, number one, he cries out, it is finished. The sin debt has been paid, right? So he doesn't suffer in hell after he dies. But then people say, well, he went to hell for the three days and three nights. Well, that also can't be true because he tells that thief, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. According to Jewish law and according to the Bible, uh, the day ended at sundown. Well, Jesus Christ is crucified. He dies about 3 o'clock. In about three hours, in order for him to make good on that promise to the thief, he's got to be with that thief in paradise. Now, that's not the third heaven. That's at the heart of the earth. The Bible said, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40 through 42, he's talking about Jonas there. And he says, A wicked and adulterer seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. He says, As Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, even so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Now, if you've ever been over there to Jerusalem, you've seen the tomb where Jesus supposedly was laid, probably was laid there, but we don't know for sure. But if you've ever seen that, it's hard to call that the heart of the earth. <laughs> I mean, it's just a little cave you walk into on the side of the hill. Hardly the heart of the earth. Jesus, the Bible says that when he died, according to Ephesians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 10, that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. You say, why did he do that? Well, you've got to understand, before Jesus Christ died on the cross, nobody goes to heaven, right? Nobody gets to heaven without the blood of Christ. So Jesus Christ goes down there. So those Old Testament saints, they weren't in hell, but they weren't in heaven either. They were in paradise. You can read Ezekiel 31. The Garden of Eden sunk down to the center of the earth, and there they were kept, the Old Testament saints, waiting for Jesus Christ. Are you ready for this? So Jesus looks over there at him. He says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. So you can imagine this dying thief shows up in paradise. And, um, and he says, uh, you know, you've got to understand all these Old Testament saints. Uh, Mo, what, listen, Noah was saved by what? What was Noah saved by? Water. Water. That's what the Bible says. He builds an ark. Moses doesn't get into the promised land because Moses strikes those those rocks, but Moses still doesn't go to hell. He goes to paradise. But what did Moses read? The Bible says that the law came by Moses. 
The Bible says that Abraham was justified by faith in Romans, but we understand that he was not fully justified until he does what? According to James 2, Abraham's not fully justified until he does what? Offers up Isaac. Rahab the harlot, she was justified how? The Bible says in James chapter 2, Rahab the harlot, she was justified by hiding those spies in her house. Understand these Old Testament saints, uh, they didn't just kneel down one day and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, please forgive me, and then they got saved. There were works involved with their salvation. So imagine the conversation. Here's this thief that shows up, and uh, he's standing there in paradise, and they said, well, how did you come? How did you come? He said, well, I was hanging on a cross, and I see that guy that popped up over here that says he's the Son of God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how I came is... I was hanging on a cross. I was a hardened criminal. He didn't have time to get baptized. He didn't have time to come down and join a church. He didn't have time to take the Lord's Supper. He didn't have time to give to charity. Understand what I'm saying? This dying thief, uh, all he did was look over and ask Jesus if he could get, Lord, will you remember me? You mean all you did was just talk to that guy over there and ask him to remember you? That's all I did. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's all I did. All I did was just ask the dude if I could come. That's it. You say, how in the world does that happen? Well, because if you remember correctly, Jesus Christ dies first, and then they go and break the legs of those thieves so that they go ahead and die. Remember that? So this dying thief's the first guy to ever get to go to paradise because of the cross. Amen, amen. 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 Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. We're almost done here. So not only do we see the criminal, the comrade, the confession, but then we see the comfort. This dying thief realizes he's a condemned sinner before God realizes there's nothing he can do. He's hanging on a cross. What can he do about it? So he looks over and confesses Jesus as Lord and asks to be remembered when Jesus comes into the kingdom. And notice Jesus says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I bet that thief wasn't expecting to be in the kingdom that day. Notice he's not talking about a, well, I'm not talking about a physical kingdom, kingdom of heaven, but that thief got to go into the kingdom of God that day. Spiritual kingdom. Isn't it amazing how... You say, wait a second, preacher, but but how in the world could... I mean, Jesus hadn't yet died on the cross. And, 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 you know, even then, you know, there's still the gospel of the kingdom and there's all these different things. Yeah, if you remember correctly, uh, we talk about dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is, a, is, is, a, is the way that you rightly divide the Bible. Different salvations, different dispensations. People in the Old Testament aren't saved the same way we are. But if you remember, throughout time, there has been a few people in the Scriptures that have transcended their dispensation. For example, you remember that Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15? She comes and she says, Lord, my daughter's sick. Jesus said, I've only come for the Jews. I didn't come for you bunch of Gentiles. And she says, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus says, I've not found so great a faith in all of Israel. Go thy way, thy daughter is healed. That was a Greek woman, a Gentile woman, that Jesus said, I'm going to talk to this Gentile woman even though I'm only sent for the Jews. She transcended her dispensation. She crossed dispensational lines. David, in the Old Testament, you didn't have eternal security. David, in the Old Testament, committed murder. Uh, He committed adultery and then committed murder to cover it up. And in the Old Testament, there was no sacrifice for those sins. The, the penalty for those sins wasn't five lambs and two turtle doves. The penalty for those sins was death. That's why David said in Psalms 51, In burnt offerings and sacrifices thou hast had no pleasure, or else I would have offered them. David knows he's at the pure mercy of the Lord. But what does David have? David has sure mercies. Amen. David is a man that transcended his dispensation in the Old Testament. And here's the dying thief under the Old Testament law. In fact, Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's got to repent and be baptized. Isn't that what John the the Baptist was preaching? Baptism for the remission of sins. 
And here's that dying thief, and he can't do any of that. He can't get in a baptismal pool. He can't call on the priest. He can't do nothing. And all he says is, Lord, remember me. And all of a sudden, the Son of Man who has power on earth to forgive sins is what Mark says. He looks over and he says, today you're going to be with me. And he transcends his dispensation. A low-down, dirty, rotten criminal who never did anything good in his life that we know of and died a death of a thief hanging on a Roman cross. As soon as he closed his eyes, he wakes up with Jesus in paradise. Now that, that is a statement. And if you're saved here, you know what Jesus Christ has said to you? Whenever you die, that very moment you're going to be with me in paradise. Isn't that a wonderful truth to know? And it's all because he died on the cross and paid all that. Me and you get to go to paradise. What a comfort that is. The hope of heaven because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. I'm going to have my wife come back. I want you to play There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. You say, why are you playing There is a Fountain Filled with Blood? Well, because if you remember in that song, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flow lose all their guilty stains. That second verse says, That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sin away. Amen. It might do you some good just to get in this altar and thank the Lord that you've got a hope of, the hope of heaven and the fact that you're one day going to be with him in paradise even though you are a condemned, guilty, dirty, rotten sinner that should have died and should have gone to hell. But you don't, because, you're not going to hell because you called on the Lord and said, Lord, remember me. Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me. And he did. And now you get to go to heaven. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. My wife's going to begin to play. If you need to come this morning... Why don't you just slip out of your seat and come down to this altar? That dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. There may I, though vile as he, wash all my sin away. Maybe there's some things in your life right now you need to get under the blood of Jesus. Some things that have happened to you that you need to confess to the Lord. Now would be a good time to do it.